tanks. I love them, and you could love them too, with World of Tanks, the sponsor of today's video. World of Tanks is a free-to-play game with a large tank arsenal, an excellent source of massive, high action battles and great ways to have strategic wins with your friends. It is a combination of history meeting action with tanks from all kinds of time periods, all kinds of nations, all coming together for grand battles. So you should go down in the description and sign up for World of Tanks. And specifically for new players, if you use the code TANKMANIA, all caps, you can get, and I literally need to pull my phone out for this one because there are so many benefits, the Excelsior Tier 5 tank, 250k credit, 7 days premium access, and 3 rental tanks for 10 battles each, those tanks being the Tiger 131, Cromwell B, T3485M. So once again, check out the description, use code TANKMANIA to get all the benefits I just told you about and enjoy some of the excellent tank action from all kinds of time periods and all kinds of battles. Thank you very much, World of Tanks, for sponsoring this video. And let's talk about funny playing game. Hello, everybody. My name is Bricky, currently experiencing the painful and fascinating sensation of what if orange was a feeling? This behind me is funny playing game. It make me go woo, it make me go tee hee, and it make me go I would say Project Wingman is a game that crossed my radar because of its overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam. I would say it was because I heard good things about it. But the real reason is because someone sent me a Twitch donation that was larger than it had any right to be and gave me a a wink. My entire life goal of 2023 is to grow the largest badonka donk ass on the planet. Sh showed a little, showed a little fin, and then it whispered sexually into my ear. Fox two, splash one bandit. After cleaning up the mess that I made of my jorts, I decided to give the game a go. Project Wingman is a classic funny playing game. It's Ace Combat, and if Ace Combat was made not by the Japanese, but rather by a heavily schizophrenic man with a grudge against most of California, which you know, most aviation nerds. Now, I haven't played a funny plane game since, oh gosh, Ace Combat 5 on the PlayStation 2 when I was nine years old. I honestly didn't see the appeal really for a while. I thought, how could a game about flying a fighter jet really be that special for anyone who wasn't a diehard stick jockey, who creams their jorts at the sight of an F-18, whose biggest turn on is a properly pronounced guns, 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 and who owns 13 grand in flight sticks and monitors to give them the, the full experience. But that's why I haven't been playing many funny plane games. Doesn't mean I won't have an open mind for this one. So I, I load it up and I'm greeted with orange. There's a lot of that that's going to be going on. Humanity has suffered a substantial collapse called the Calamity, and the world is weakened and divided hundreds of years later. Global superpowers are generally assisted by the highest bidder as mercenaries make up a surprisingly large amount of their fighting force. You are one such mercenary. Call sign Monarch. You are our silent protagonist working for the group Sicario, hired by the Cascadian Republic, aka American Canada, to fight the Federation, aka not America and Canada, aka the world. <laughs> now, I'm not going to pretend for a single second that this game has a story that is high art or normal or realistic or not the ramblings of an institutionalized man, but I call a point that my immersion has already been broken. Call sign Monarch. Monarch. That is way too nice. Aviation call signs I thought were always like inside jokes or horribly unflattering like shrimp, grape, taco. I didn't eat before this. Barbecue bacon burger and a large order of fries and orange soda with no ice and a piece of hot apple pie. My immersion? Ruined. I don't see a single barbecue bacon burger on screen. But playing funny plane game is honestly not as difficult as I thought it would be. As I imagine it is with most flight games, the hardest part is generally maneuvering your aircraft. The actual gameplay is damn easy. Look for the green boxes, get close to them, and then when the green boxes turn to orange boxes, then you press B on your controller to box two them into oblivion. You will be using a controller, by the way. You will be using a controller. You will not be playing this on keyboard. This is not a decision to be made. This is a command. The game is available in VR though, which I did not play because 
pain. But I hopped into my plane and began the missions and started off rather enthused. The game was really pretty. Environments were beautifully made, particle effects were very nice. There's just this nice sense of smoothness to everything. It naturally took a bit for me to get the handle of my plane as I was never one to grab the jet in Battlefield, but once I began flying properly, the gameplay just kind of smooths out in a really good way. It almost becomes second nature after a while, the way you break while turning and how you rotate 90 degrees and then turn up in order to go a direction instead of using your, your little B-man flaps. The things that took me a little were just the small stuff, like realizing the types of weapons you have and how to properly use the gun. Because Project Wingman is four general weapons, multi-purpose, anti-air, anti-ground, and gun. But these are split up into a few different varieties. Multi-purpose can target ground or air and are often heat-seeking. Anti-air were often multi-locks or guided heat-seeking, I think is the the word. Well, basically you have to either lock onto four targets and fire four rockets or hold the target in this big old little hexagon circle-y thing until the missile hits. SAA, my beloved. Then there were bombs, which are also known as dog shit. Ground targets can be handled in so many ways that bombs are just, just not it. Ever. Their blast radius is too small, moving targets invalidate them, and sure you might do okay with some bombs, but when you can just strafing run them with guns or use multi-purpose fire and forget missiles, why would you even bother with bomb unless you were flexing? And finally, you have guns. Every plane has guns, and when you are targeting another plane, you need to line them up with that little reticle thing that falls behind them a bit. It's basically shooting in front of them so that the bullets land, you get the whole concept. Now, while every plane does have guns, there are some planes that can mount more guns and some planes that can mount all guns. SK-25, my beloved. Now, almost every plane gets a bunch of STDM multi-purpose missiles to play with as well as its internal gun. The SK-25 is a two-seater slut that holds the internal gun, the missiles, and up to three more hard points worth of gun. Big gun, shotgun, and burt gun. Enjoy. However, tons of different aircraft have various speeds and weapons they can mount. Some have fewer hard points and trade that for more base missiles and far superior speed. Some excel in anti-ground, some in anti-air, and it all really depends on what you want to run. There is simply one rule. You make sure you run two-seater planes. Because the best girl Prez is your WSO, Weapon Systems Officer, and she is the only way you can get voice lines for your plane as you are a silent protagonist. And you don't want to make her sad and leave her at home, so you always take two-seater planes. Again, this is not a suggestion, this is a command. I will not hear Prez disparaging on this day. Or you can download the Prez Everywhere mod, which straps a Devil May Cry white lawn chair to the top of the plane. Not literally, but I'm sure a modder out there, you know, can assist with that one. Now the plane and the loadout you pick will definitely adjust how well you do in the game. But honestly, so long as you take a somewhat balanced loadout against the enemy, you should be fine. There are rare occasions I ever even get close to running out of the classic STDM missiles or even my main gun with the exception of some of the longest missions. Speaking of missions, there are a grand total of 21 of them in the main campaign. They have very exciting objectives as well, such as destroy Cordium, stop people from entering country, secure new base, rescue people, rescue boat, destroy boat, destroy city, survive the apocalypse, defeat the French, yes, yes, make a man mauled and end his molding. The missions are really not that exciting when it comes to their premise. It's classic military actions, and classic military actions are not that interesting to talk about. But what the story's main purpose is, is to give the player a reason to visit brand new locations and enemy varieties to fight. It's all just a vehicle to get you to do awesome new stuff. In fact, I think most of the game seems to be that way. You know, I mentioned in my Modern Warfare 2 review that I went back to play the old one, like, MW2 in 2009 remaster. And what I found out more than anything was that the missions were surprisingly short, but were absolutely 
filled with constant dialogue, stuff to do, and neat locations. The entirety of actually quite a lot of the earlier COD campaigns was to simply get you somewhere to do dope stuff and fill your brain with nothing but action and spectacle so you didn't care about the rest. Project Wingman feels exactly the same. The story is fine. It's serviceable. The gameplay is not anything really special. It's actually extremely repetitive when you think about it, and the characters aren't that special except for Prez, our beloved. But it's not, it's not the individual parts of Project Wingman that make it great. It's how they all just kind of come together. It's also a huge emphasis on the aesthetics of the game. And that's something I haven't even really brought up yet. I mean, like, like, look at it. The game is beautiful and it feels like so incredibly epic to play. Every single mission, you will have double digit moments of badassery where you, where you nearly miss another plane or a railgun like flies right by your head or you're doing a straight run on one of those giant airships and just barely getting out of the way in time before you collide into it. Remember those old like battlefield trailers like only in battlefield moments where the trailers were actually when the game felt like remember when battlefield <laughs> I'm sad this is actually where you get those moments this feels more akin to those old Titanfall trailers that felt exactly how the game felt I have trailer moments almost every single game and there's just enough of them before the end of the mission for me to not get tired of said mission and the music oh my god the game is a sum of its parts and the only reason i didn't mention the music until now is because i badly wanted to create a mo a montage of epic plain game moments to the background of this game's music please hit it music in this game cannot be understated. Almost every single track is at minimum above average, and then you get the real bangers, and it just feels sensational. You're just spinning around fighter jets, taking out boats, and you look behind you and say, talk to me, Prez, and she's there with two drumsticks and a smug smile on her face going... Project Wingman, in many aspects, feels rather amateurish. But I don't mean that it's like an insult or anything. The game's visuals are incredible and practically AAA standards, and it has a soundtrack that meets that standard too. However, a lot of the other stuff, like the voice acting, feels as if he just kind of gathered a bunch of friends and said, hey, you, you want to do a couple of lines for a game? When you think about it too, the animation and textures of the game don't need to be that amazing either, since everything is generally viewed from very, very far away. All that really matters is your plane. But this gives it this feeling of like your best friend made a video game C come on over and play it with him which is more accurate than you might think because this game was made by three people a writer a composer and the coder or the guy who does the you know three fucking people put this game together three people which is why it's so engrossing because that amateurish quality is its charm like it's christmas eve and your cousin's been hyping everyone up to show you what they've been making all year and you just kind of waltz in there upon this like fake smile and be supportive of your cousin but then you're all here thinking like wait this is kind of good. Wait a minute, this is kind of great. He made this? Cousin Timmy put this together? Just him and his two other friends? Cousin Timmy, where did you get this creativity? Is, is that Uncle Bob there voicing Galaxy? Where did you get a composer like this? Damn. You got the number of the of the girl who voices Prez? And this just keeps going over and over again until the family is all there watching Cousin Timmy's game and they're so into the game and they're cheering and they're laughing and they're having a good time and then someone asks, hey Cousin Timmy, didn't you say your favorite color was orange? Goodness gracious, great balls of fire! 
No, Timmy. The Geneva Convention is a guideline, not a checklist. I've said this game's story isn't anything to write home about, and, and it isn't. But I gotta say, there's, there's a small bit that just kind of gets me. So, so you're fighting for the Cascadians, right? And you've been hounded occasionally by this other mercenary group called the Peacekeepers and their squadron, Crimson. Crimson Squadron has the classic, oh, we're not strong enough to take them on right now. You gotta run away trope in the beginning of the game. And they come back to fight you many times. Now, there are two modules planes often have. They have flares and the AOA limiter. Now, flares divert missiles, of course, but the AOA limiter lets you do that aerial freefall so you can change directions mid-air and blast off in another direction. It's horribly unrealistic. A monarch is made of jelly at this point, but it's insanely valuable and badass as hell. The only downside is that it's normally only available on one-seater planes, so, you know, no prez, no fly, sorry. <laughs> However, the enemies, and especially Crimson Squadron, don't abide by these rules, as they have flares and an AOA limiter. So every time you're prepared to blast their ass, they hit you with the 180 YY no scope off the crane on high rise and dip the other way. And then you, young citizen, are welcomed by the beautiful sound of missile tracking over and over and over again until it's proliferating your dreams and turning them into nightmares. I don't believe in holistic wellness. I believe in holistic agony. I set my alarm clock to the beeping sound of incoming missiles and I wake up in a sweat screaming while my left thumb tries to match the player's command. But the first official boss fight against Crimson Squadron is pretty great. The music is fantastic and the, the fight is sufficiently challenging. Each of the members are quite hard to kill, so it makes for an excellent combat encounter. The thing is, I, Monarch, had depicted myself as the Chad, and Crimson One as the Soy Jack. And he doesn't take this well. And if you were to look up the term malding in the dictionary, you wouldn't find anything, it's not a real word. But if it was a word, you would find an image of Crimson One. Because in response to being beaten, he decides the greatest decision is to take his jorts strap them with Cordium cruise missiles and destroy the home he's fighting for, which in turn causes a brand new apocalypse with red lightning and orange. If the Calamity was so cool, why isn't there a Calamity 2? Now there is. There's so much orange in this game, and a ton of it is done directly by a man who's molded so hard about being beaten that he had his giggling Joker arc and then bombed his own home. Yeah, that'll show me. Me? And Prez, my beloved, just sitting here wondering if Edward's cinema can even project this hard. I've been saying this game is just reasons for you to do cool things and visit cool places, so welcome to the coolest place on Earth, the Fanta Factory. Orange Crush Soda calling themselves the Kings of Orange, and Crimson One saying, that's pretty arrogant considering the company you're in. And I just, I cannot express to you how ridiculous the ending of this game is. Most of the game, you're doing classic military missions. Right? Your silly little tasks and silly little mercenary shenanigans. And then the guy you bodied last time decides to nuke his own home out of rage. This sets off the Ring of Fire. Yes, the, the, the geographical Ring of Fire. And turns the entire western coast into an apocalypse. Now, you're playing for scraps between each nation. And I haven't, I haven't even mentioned the French lady who straps rail guns to her jet and you dueled with. I also didn't mention that the city that they turned over Orange happened to be named Prospero. Yes, the burning of Prospero. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hit Magnus with the backbreaker. I punched out one of his hearts. Sick it, Lehman, you furry fuck. But then, okay, uh, you're doing some recuperating, you know. You're doing better things, you're doing well for a few missions, and bam, you're in the final mission, right? Presidia. A long and extremely fun mission where you take out all the various defenses of the Federation, all of their air, sea, and ground forces. And you bring it all together for that final strike and then you realize that me ricky have lied to you crimson one didn't blow up prospero because he was molding the federation did that as a scorched earth policy because they're evil or whatever why do i tell you this because now it's crimson one's turn to blow up his own home the man is molding so goddamn hard at you beating him that he's gone rogue and he blows up the entire last bastion of the country he's been paid to fight for every game out there has told you that living in california is terrible well guess what project wingman has the solution new california 
Wait a minute, I live in California. So if you thought you were sick of the color orange, then that's too bad, kiddo, because now orange is love and orange is life. And now we have one of the most needlessly epic gaming moments I've seen in a while. This is the final mission in the game, and it is surprisingly dour. It doesn't feel like you're fighting to win a war or even fighting to save a nation, but rather you're fighting over the scraps of what's left. Crimson One is absolutely insane at this point due to many factors throughout the story. A and in classic, yo, dude, wouldn't it be awesome if we did this fashion? You get to have a massive 1v1 boss fight just above the Fanta Zone, and also, by the way, that's an active volcano behind me. Let me put this as nicely as I can. The game does not earn this level of epicness. It doesn't earn this. Like, it treats its boss fight with the same level of bombastic zeal that I expected in the final fight of a Souls game, or, or like a multi-part MCU villain's final showdown. It's so needlessly epic. The dialogue, the music, the atmosphere, the combat, it's all so ridiculous, and it's, it's, not, it's not earned. It's funny playing game. Like, it doesn't earn this, and yet it's so cool. And when I say he doesn't earn it, it's not like the rest of the game was bad or anything of that. It's mainly the fact that just it hasn't it hasn't earned it. Like this is the most ridiculously over the top final boss fight for some dude who's just molding really damn hard. And yet for some reason it's it's so cool. It's so cool. I, I have never seen someone who is able to, to will a game to be epic. Three devs, writer, coder, composer, all came together and used their chakra to form a spirit bomb of badassery and put it in their game. This is the definition of someone who has willed their product through the human spirit to be epic. They treat this boss fight like it's God versus the devil, when it's in reality a silent protagonist and a soy jack mercenary in one extremely cute WSO. <laughs> Kill him. This entire fight is ridiculous. Crimson One is fast as hell, has flares, has the AOA limiter, and has a ridiculous arsenal to dust you with. It's three phases, and the first one is a volley of micro missiles, and then in phase two, he brings out the railgun spam, and in phase three, he drops airborne proximity bombs. The whole thing is a gigantic amount of insanity, all while being accompanied by the most banger of tracks. It's so absolutely fantastic and just sells this whole final bit of funny plain gameplay. It's challenging, it's fun, it's exciting, it's the sum of its parts. The whole game is the sum of its parts. And it ends with me feeling extremely satisfied. Nothing made me think it was revolutionary or outstanding in its field, but when brought together and when given sufficient wife material in the back seat, Project Wingman is just an excellent game. When you play something that was made by one guy, uh, say Stardew Valley, or even a small team like Hollow Knight, incredible games, yes, but they feel like this quality is so much higher, like it's all made by big, big dev teams. Project Wingman feels like it was made by a couple of guys, and that's kind of the charm. I didn't expect greatness from it, and it has this kind of amateur quality to a lot of it. Often when I see overwhelmingly positive on Steam, it's not a sign that the game is, is pure 10 out of 10 piece of content. It often can vary between like seven out of 10s to 10 out of 10s, but has a strong love by its community for some reason or another. It's a game that leaves you with a feeling, or more importantly, makes you feel passionate about it. There are plenty of 10 out of 10 overwhelmingly positive games. 
Outer Wilds, the greatest game ever made, will be one of them. But there are other games like, okay, let's say Deep Rock Galactic, which love Deep Rock Galactic, but I wouldn't call Deep Rock a 10 out of 10 game. But I do think it deserves overwhelmingly positive because it's a feeling I get left with because it's the fact that I can open up that game and feel the passion behind the developers, the care put into it. And when I leave the game, just yelling rock and stone, it gets in my bones, it, it gets in my jorts. I may never pick up Project Wingman again. And it's far from one of my favorite games out there, but it's a game I can wholeheartedly recommend and completely understand why it has that Steam rating for the passion, time, and craftsmanship of just a few individuals, a handful of voice actors, and the babe in the back seat. Speaking of that, and speaking of passion, I found there's actually no official Prez art. She's just a helmet, you know, in the back and... That's just not acceptable to me, you know? I found some fan art of her and you know, it's pretty cute. Wouldn't it be just kinda hilarious if I commissioned some Prez artwork from various artists in various styles, some of it safe for work, some of it not safe for work, and put the links to it and the artists on my Twitter and Discord that are both linked in the description? I'd be insane. It'd be even crazier if I commissioned propaganda style posters, actually had them for sale as gigantic photo paper prints available at my merch store at orchidate.com, link in the description. But I couldn't imagine doing that. I'd just be crazy talk. Good on you, Project Wingman devs. You wanted to make Ace Combat and you wanted to make your Ace Combat. And unlike 99.9999999% of people who asked for a new game in a genre, you went out and you made it. You sat down and said, I like playing games. There aren't enough playing games. I'm going to make a playing game. And to that, I say, Based. Thank you everyone very much for watching this video. Uh, thank you to my patrons as well. Uh, assigned to note though, uh, I actually am going to be closing my Patreon this month. Uh, I do not think I offer enough for it. Uh, I'm going to keep it up for this month of January, put the names in the whole thing, uh, but I'm actually going to be closing it very shortly. I'm very transactional in a sense when it comes to any kind of donation and thing. So if you are supporting me via Patreon, I appreciate it, but I don't think I'm offering enough back to you. So if you still want to support me, just go buy some merch, check out Gamersups, go join me on my Twitch stream. These are all options, but for Patreon, uh, I don't think I, I give back enough uh, for the uh, nature of it. So um, thank you a ton, but that will be going away shortly. Uh, though I really do appreciate your support very, very much. I've noticed a lot of new viewers come around only mentioning you from Adric or in relation to 40K. Are you at all concerned as to how people might come to know you for or come to see it for content? Kind of like the days with League. Not as much because League of Legends is a game that you basically are forced to eat and breathe League all the time. League players often don't play other games sometimes, whereas Warhammer is a physical kind of game that you just make little, you know, fun miniatures and stuff. And so it's more of a side hobby and not the only thing you do. And if it is the only thing you do, well, I mean, you might not be watching my content a ton in that case. Do you think you'll play Cult of the Lamb either for a stream or a video? I may at some point. It looks really cute. Looks like a nice, quick, fun romp, but uh, haven't got around to it yet. If you had to be a follower of a Chaos God, which one would you follow? Probably Nurgle. He seems chill. Thank you again, everyone, for watching. Uh, go play Funny Playing Game. It's in the description. It's a good time. Come on. Obviously, you're a skater.